We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that we really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics. Joining me today is Ted Butler from butlerresearch.com. How are you today, Ted? I'm I'm fine, uh, Tom. Thanks for the uh, the opportunity to speak with you. Well, it's great to have you back. And uh, of course, the last time we spoke, we talked a lot about the silver short position, and I think that's absolutely important to talk about here again. So, the last time we were kind of speaking, you were telling me about the the massive short position that exists in silver, so, and it's larger than any other commodity. So maybe give us a refresher on on who holds this position and why it's so lucrative and important for them to hold. Basically, the short position exists on on the COMEX in the COMEX futures market. It is a uh, short position held by traders that that are classified as uh, as commercials. But just because they're classified as commercials doesn't mean that they're not speculating because, uh, to me, it, it's obvious that they are speculators. But that, that word, uh, uh, commercials, throws people off. And uh, further, if you look at the details of the commitment of t- traders report, uh, uh, the biggest portion of the commercial short position is held in a category that the uh, CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, uh, classifies as uh, producers, merchants, uh, et cetera. And it gives the impression, gives the, the false impression that the vast majority of the commercial short position is held by, say, mining companies or producers of actual producers of, of silver when Nothing could be further from the truth. It's there's they're not uh, there's no mining companies that I'm aware of that are short the silver market via the COMEX or through representatives that are short on the COMEX. So that that's one thing off the top of my head is that the commercial short position I'm about to speak about is held by miners that are legitimately hedging or selling against their production. That's not the case whatsoever. Further, what makes the commercial short position in COMEX silver and to a lesser extent gold and uh, platinum and and some other commodities, but not like silver, is that the position is highly concentrated, meaning that it is held by very few traders, according, again, to data in the data in in the Commitment of Traders report, which shows that the four largest Uh, shorts on the COMEX hold roughly, I'm going to speak in rough numbers, 60,000 contracts net short or 300 million ounces. And if you add in the next four largest commercial traders, they're short an additional 20,000 contracts or another 100 million ounces, a total of eight traders holding roughly 400 million ounces uh, short. Now, this is as of the data in the uh, co- con- in the Commitment of Traders report as of January 26th, before we had this run-up in, in price. Today is the cutoff for the new Commitment of Traders report on, on Friday. So with these numbers most likely will be higher, so I'm, I'm not understating it. There's no other commodity that has as large a concentrated short position in terms of real world production and and consumption as in silver. And, And I would contend that if this concentrated short position in silver did not exist, then the price automatically would have to be substantially higher, say by a factor of one or two, $50. Seventy-five dollars, some number. Oh, if this concentrated short position were more in line or in line with the sh- concentrated short position in all other commodities. In other words, if 
legitimate, and I'm considering the concentrated short position in silver as being highly illegitimate, okay, and and I would say illegal, uh, if it were forced, if you were to force other traders, many other traders to replace these few concentrated shorts, okay, you'd have to make those other traders an offer they couldn't refuse. And the only offer that you could give to other traders that would be something they couldn't refuse would be substantially higher prices. Uh, so in order for this concentrated short position to dissipate and be in line with other uh, commodities, the price of silver would have to be substantially higher. And therein lies the rub. Therein lies the quandary uh, and dilemma in, in silver. It's cheap, okay, the cheapest commodity around, a lot cheaper today than it was yesterday. Uh, we're speaking on Tuesday. And the reason for that it's so cheap is because of this concentrated short position. So, Ted, as you're as you're talking about this concentrated short position, do you mean that it's do you use the word concentrated simply because it's such a large position in such a small market or is it because it's at a concentrated price level? Uh, no, I mean something completely different. I mean that it's a very large, massive, short position held by a very small number of traders. This uh, designation of four traders and eight traders is the designation that the Commodity uh, Commission uses to, to analyze every commodity. This data is in every commodity and it's the definition it's not my definition of concentration it's the definition of the commodity futures trading commission they're the ones that that have provided this concentrated data uh and the reason they do it is a very important reason the reason that they show this concentration data is because if a position is too concentrated either long or short Okay, that raises the strong suspicion that there could be price manipulation involved. You cannot have a price manipulation without a concentrated position. Let me repeat that. It's like impossible. There can be no such thing as price manipulation without a concentrated position. Let me give you an example. We all know, and it's been proven, that back in 1980, the Hunt brothers and their associates uh, were accused and convicted, okay, of uh, manipulating the, the price of silver to the upside. It ran from, you know, in, in one year, it ran from like $7 to $50, okay? And the reason that the same commodity agency that we're talking about was able to successfully show that the hunts manipulated the price of silver is because of their concentrated long position. If people get together, a couple of people get together, a handful of people get together and conspire and collude to buy as much of a commodity as they possibly can in all forms, physical, futures, any way you want to, you, you, you can buy it. And they do that with the intent and purpose of driving up the price that's manipulation. That's obvious for everyone to see. The problem with the concentrated short position in silver currently is that short positions are difficult for people to even comprehend. As in, how the hell can you sell something that you don't own? It's not a typical transaction that everybody goes through every day. It's highly unusual. It's like people, I had trouble when I first became a broker at Merrill Lynch 50 years ago. It took me a month to figure out how can anybody go short? How can you, how the heck can you sell something that you don't own? Okay, now you can in commodity futures or all derivatives markets because 
you know, you have to have a long and a short to make up a derivatives contract, okay? So that's, shorting is allowed. There's nothing wrong with shorting in a, in a futures and a derivatives and options contract. It's mandatory. What's not mandatory is that the position be so closely held and concentrated, one side or the other, the long side or the short side, be concentrated in so few hands as to constitute price manipulation. Concentration is not a term I'm inventing. It's a term that's in every commodity, every commitment of traders report on every commodity that we trade. And it's the CFTCs, the government's own definition of what a closely held position is. So it's concentration means a big position held by a very small number of traders. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about this this short position, maybe just explain to us again how this exerts downward pressure on the price and how this could create a very you know sharp move upward if they had to try and eliminate their short positions. Uh, well, that's the that that's the key issue. The the reason that silver is to start is so cheap in price, and we we have to agree on certain basic things. I mean, I don't think there's many people. You've had many guests on on, on your show that uh, that make very strong cases for silver going to fifty, a hundred, two hundred dollars. Okay, and I don't argue with any of them. The reason, though, is that it's possible that such a big move uh, w would come in to uh, come into silver, in, in essence, is because it's so darn cheap to begin with, okay? It's that. It's like compared to gold, compared to anything else, else that you want to look at, even despite the recent price increases that it's had and until today, it, it is still basically a cheap commodity. And uh, the reason it's cheap is because there's been so much concentrated short selling on it and selling of any type, whether it's you're know, selling something you don't own or, or whether you're selling it something you own. Selling is, is what is a downward force on prices. Buying is an upward force on prices. So if there's a bigger concentrated short position in silver than there is in any other commodity when you compare it to real world production and real world consumption, it naturally Actually, stands that that this concentrated short position would have some influence on price. Certainly, a concentrated short position or any kind of a short position wouldn't drive prices higher. It would tend to cap and cause prices to go lower. It would offset and balance and overbalance any buying forces that came in. What's, what's so illegitimate about the, the silver short position on the COMEX is that it, it is not, it's not based on anything except, okay, no legitimate reason except that it's, if they were to cover, okay, if they were to try and, and buy back this short position, it would send prices to the moon. And that would eat alive the, the, the current short sellers, the, the current concentrated short sellers. So it's a matter of why why they're not covering and why they're selling more, okay, to drive prices down or to keep prices in check is because they are in the fight of their life, okay? They are in, they're in a desperate situation to keep this price down because if prices start to explode and do what silver prices do what they should do, that's going to be good for everybody who owns silver, who is long silver, long silver stocks. It's going to be very, very bad, okay, for four and eight large traders on the COMEX. And those four and eight large traders on the COMEX, on the short side, are, are against fighting uh, the, the natural inclination for prices to go up. And it's like four or eight traders basically against the rest of the world. And they're desperate to keep the price down because if prices go up, they are going to get slaughtered more than they than they're already out they're out many billions of dollars as we speak now in both gold and silver and they're desperate to keep this price down because 
it'll be the end of them as far as the losses that they will incur. And also, perhaps even more importantly, is that if silver prices were to explode, like they're going to explode someday, it will show, it'll prove, it'll be the final proof that these prices, silver prices, have been manipulated and suppressed for the decades that I claim that they have been suppressed. And what that'll mean is anybody who ever lost money for the last 30 years or so, in, and that includes silver mining companies and silver investors that lost money over this whole period of time, these four and eight large crooks, these short crooks, will be held liable. And they will not be able to uh, withstand the lawsuits and, and liability that will come from this silver ma manipulation being fully exposed. So you have to understand, these guys, these four and eight large shorts, are in a desperate position, and they're not about to give up. And if you're looking for a reason why they smacked down silver prices today even more than they went up yesterday, and it wasn't that much in some ways, this is the answer. Mm -hmm. They can't afford to let it go. they got to fight this thing tooth and nail, and they're going to do so until they're basically carried out on stretchers. And I I'm I'm awaiting for that day. That's going to be a glorious day. So, Ted, as as you're talking about the fact that they're holding these big positions, how are they really smashing the price back down? What kind of mechanisms are they using to do this? Oh, that's that's a different story. That's the uh, you know these these guys are these crooks are like vermin in the night. Okay, <laughs> like you turn over a rock and you see all these creepy looking bugs and worms crawling out that's what these shorts are like they operate mostly when everybody else is asleep to get a head up it's always a nighttime move that uh, they do it in the middle of the night nobody can do anything about it this is the kind of they have a kind of certain uh, proprietary trading tricks spoofing and high frequency trading they they know all the dirty tricks in the world to get prices rolling down the hill when they wanted to get it rolling down the hill and at that point they usually are big buyers they buy on the way uh, the way down they don't they don't sell on the way down they sell a little bit to get things rolling downhill but this is like part and parcel this is this has to do with the big settlements that they that they just made against the JP Morgan and Bank America and Deutsche Bank and Bank of Nova Scotia for the spoofing and the and the dirty trading tricks that they that they use on the COMEX, okay? So there's there's a whole variety of things. You can ask yourself, like, why did silver go down so much today? It's like, did everybody that bought yesterday decide to, to sell all the retail people that were beating the doors down to buy silver? Did they, did they decide immediately to sell in the middle of last night that we're going to start selling now? No. I mean, there are traders out there who bought, okay, on the way up yesterday and before, that we're following price signals, technicians, etc., momentum traders, okay, of which I'm not. That's not my that's not my stick. But there are people that do that. And if prices go up, they buy. And if prices start to come down for whatever the reason, legitimate or not, they'll start to sell too. So it's it's like a it's like a game. It's like it's a it's a facade. It's like it's it's real. I mean it's real money and they and they knock the price of mining companies down to Today, and they knocked the price of physical silver down today, and they knocked the price of everything silver related down today. But it, it wasn't legitimate, and they do have dirty tricks to do it. You know, to do it, it's it's their trading game. I mean, it's their casino. They can kind of do what they want, set the rules. Every once in a while, the CFTC will come out, and the Justice Department will come out, and you know, slap their hands a little bit, but. The game continues to go on until, until the whole jig is up. Physical demand overtakes all these short-term paper trading tricks. It's, uh, it's like the best I can describe it to you. Mm -hmm. So, as you mentioned, J.P. Morgan, um, of course, we're talking this morning on February second, and. 
JP mentioned or, or had a press release that was saying that they downgraded the silver mining sector. So is this another example to you of another one of their tricks to try and drive the price and the interest down in this sector? Perhaps, but I, I don't want to make the, the direct uh, 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 correlation because, you know, uh, J.P. Morgan is a uh, giant uh, financial organization, 250,000 employees, I believe, something like that. And, uh, you know, it might have been, uh, you know, an individual, you know, mining analyst or whatever at, at J.P. Morgan that issued the recommendation that's and so, you know, coincide with a down day. Look, it could be more nefarious than I'm suggesting, and you could be, you know, 100% correct that uh, this is, uh, you know, just part and parcel of a whole uh, manipulative scheme to manipulate uh, silver prices. I, I don't know. I mean, it sounds a little blatant to me, but uh, these guys are usually a little more sophisticated in, in, in what they do. I mean, they don't like to leave too much of a, uh, of a trail, but uh, I, I suppose it, it, it could be... Uh, it could be the case. I would say this, though. I mean, you knock the price of silver down, and it stands to reason that the mining shares of, of silver mining companies are, are going to come down as well. So you want to go to the real source of the manipulation. The real source of the manipulation is where the price of silver is set, and the price of silver is set on the COMEX. End of sentence. That's it. It's like it. So if you can control the price of silver, you know, uh, via the COMEX, which is what happens in reality, then uh, you can com- control the price of anything, uh, any in- investment vehicle that is related to silver, such as silver mining companies. Mm-hmm. Ted, w- when you're saying the the price needs to be controlled as, at the physical level, or let's say the physical would break the paper price, can you explain to us a bit more about how that could work? Oh, sure. I mean, this, this is the key uh, the, the key factor. Uh, you got to understand. I, I don't mean to get long winded here, but uh, silver is a very unique commodity. Okay, it's the only commodity that has. A, a dual component to its in, it, to its demand, and by that I mean it's an industrial commodity, vital industrial commodity, best reflector of light of, of light in the world, best conductor of electricity in the world. So so many different things that it's used in a wide variety of industrial applications, and it's uh, it's also in addition to all its industrial and jewelry and coin fabrication demand that it also has that's one side of the demand component profile on the other side is that it's a primary investment item as well which is kind of why we're talking here today it's like it's of interest to people as a primary investment uh, asset no other commodity let me repeat that no other commodity has this particular profile Gold is mostly 90% investment, little bit industrial. Copper is 100% industrial, no real investment uh, uh, demand. And platinum and palladium, you know, mostly industrial, little bit of investment, but not like silver. Silver has got it's got both. It's got the industrial demand and it's got, and I say industrial, I mean jewelry and coin fabrication and solar panels and electric cars and every damn thing you can, you can imagine is it uses silver. And on the other side of the equation, we have an investment demand. People buy it because they like it. It's been, a, been, a, been around for thousands of years and uh, it's an investment uh, item as well. So this unique uh, characteristic we can see on the retail investment side, breaking down the investment component into two categories, wholesale and retail. There's no doubt that a surge of investment demand came into the retail side and completely cleaned out most of the dealer network 
okay, throughout this country and perhaps the world, uh, because we don't keep big inventories in anything anymore. Nobody does. And it's basically, if you get a rush of an investment demand on the retail side, it, it cleans them out. I mean, it happens periodically. This is not the first time this has happened. This looks a little bit different than than what I've seen in, in, in the past, but there's no doubt that they cleaned out uh, the retail side of uh, inventories for forms of silver, coins, and small bars, and, and things like that. All right, well, what happens on the retail side is, is not the same as what happens on the wholesale side. When you run out of, when you run out of retail uh, forms of silver, which we've just run out of in a matter of a couple of days, okay, when you run out, what happens is the premiums shoot up. And uh, I guess you could find, you know, silver that you want to buy if instead of paying, you know, $30 for a, for a silver eagle, you know, you're willing to pay $40, even though the price of silver hasn't changed that much. I guess you could find, you know, silver to buy, but it's the premiums that that have exploded on these retail forms of silver because the silver is not available. But that doesn't really affect the wholesale price of silver, the COMEX price of silver, the price of silver in the SLV and other silver ETFs. That kind of silver is all 1,000 ounce bar demand. And right now, we haven't had the kind of shortages out in the 1,000 ounce bar market that we have had in the retail market. But there's signs of that developing. In fact, yesterday, for the first time in my memory, the price of nearby silver in the futures market, COMEX, uh, March, the key contract, closed at a premium of about five cents or so, a total of a nine cent move in the day compared to the, the next contract, May. Uh, it's corrected today. It's corrected today. There's no question about it. But what really drove the price being sold off sharply today was the budding signs of a shortage, overall tightness in the thousand ounce bar contract. And if we were to have a shortage develop, in the 1,000-ounce bar market, and it can easily develop because the people that rush to buy COMEX contracts and the people that buy to rush and buy SLV or other silver ETFs like the Sprott ETF or the SIVR, and there's a whole bunch of them out there now. It's not just the SLV. They're dealing in 1,000-ounce uh, bars, 1,000-ounce bars of silver. This is the wholesale trade. If we were to have a shortage of developing shortage of, of, of thousand ounce bars, then it, it's Katie bar the door because there's a sleeping giant out there that the crooks, the big four, the big eight crooks, short crooks on the COMEX dare not awaken. And, and that sleeping giant is the collective user community, the industrial user community, the community that relies upon the availability, free availability of 1,000-ounce bars. If these 1,000-ounce bars start to get uh, into a delayed delivery situation, just like we now have a delayed delivery situation on the retail side, you can't get what's not there, okay, then all hell is going to break loose. Investors in, in silver eagles and bars and even 1,000-ounce bars of silver don't really mind. It's an inconvenience, but they don't really mind waiting for a delayed delivery because the stuff isn't available. It's an investment, okay? They can live with it. You'll get it later. You won't get it today. You'll get it later. If I want it, I live with it, okay? What am I going to do? I got I to gotta, I gotta wait. I got to wait. That's an investor. A user is not that way. A user is different. A user needs that silver delivered today or he or she goes out of business, has to shut down his assembly lines, has to send the employees home, and that ain't going to happen to Tesla or Apple Computer or anybody or General Motors or anybody else, any industrial user that uses silver, and we use most of it, most of the production is used the way I'm describing, okay, these people 
have been raised for the last 40 years, 30, 40 years on a just-in-time inventory delivery basis. Nobody maintains inventories of anything anymore. It's like you could see that happening with toilet paper a year ago (laughs) or any other item that all of a sudden disappeared off the shelves. If this 1,000-ounce bar shortage results in, leads to, and results in delivery delays to the likes of Tesla or Apple Computer or any other electronic manufacturer, anybody who uses solar panels, anybody who uses silver, if they're faced with delays, these guys are going to panic. They're going to do what everybody did when there wasn't enough toilet paper to go around. They're going to rush and buy 1,000-ounce bars, put them on the shelves, wait for a rainy day, buy more than they need to buy if they're delayed. Now, I don't know, uh, you know if that's going to occur right now. I know that's going to occur someday and hopefully someday, someday soon. And no one knows this equation better than the four and eight largest crooks on the COMEX who are short. And the reason for today's smackdown in price, just like the reason for every smackdown in price that we've seen for decades, is to keep these sleeping giants, these industrial users, asleep. Don't wake them up. Don't give them any sign that there might not be a lot of silver or enough silver to go around, okay, in order to cause them to panic, to build up their own inventories, which, of course, will exacerbate and just make the, the shortage that much worse. But it's coming, and that's the, that's the physical that I talk about that's going to overwhelm these guys someday. Now, if you're going to ask me which day, I'm going to say I don't know. But I do see the signs of that perhaps being stronger today than they have been in the past, and it may not be that much longer. And these big four and eight crooks, banks mostly, on the COMEX know this better than anyone, and that's the reason for the price smackdown today. They nip this thing in the bud. Keep that price from from going up and keep those silver users asleep. Don't give them any reason to panic. So if we think about how to kind of best play this, Ted, would would the best idea to, let's say, increase demand for this 1,000-ounce bar category be to buy these ETFs like SLV or or PSLV and maybe give us – kind of an an overview of the differences let's say just between those two well i don't i don't see any re- any real differences i i didn't set them up okay they all thousand, the 1000 ounce bar form that i talk about that is you know that is is used by the the industrial consumers is also you know it's a, it's the standard industry unit of trade it's uh it's what every uh, silver etf or investment fund holds it's, it's the basis for the the comex contract it i didn't make it up i mean i i didn't dictate that uh, we're going to deal in in thousand ounce bars that that's just the way it's developed it's logical that that's the, the way silver has always been um basically denominated on, on a wholesale basis so the fact of the matter is that unless the the, the sellers in, in SLV and, and the other silver ETFs, the, the, they call it, you know, authorized participants, APs, so far they've been able to come up with enough physical silver to meet the demand. There's been enormous demand. There's been like almost 100 million ounces in the last week or so between, you know, the SLV and other silver ETFs. It, it should have blown you know, the price sky high. It shouldn't have been a 2 or $3 uh, a jump in, in the price of silver. We're, we're talking about a, a discontinuous event when you got, you know, 100 million ounces of physical silver demanded in, in about a week in a market that was tight to begin with. The miracle was uh, not that it went up. The, the miracle was that it only went up 
you know, eight or ten percent uh, before getting slammed back down today. If, if you if people knew the real circumstances and and situation in silver, the real question is is not you know the headlines on TV all day yesterday how much silver went up. It didn't go up that much. It's like it's a ten percent is nothing. Two dollars, three dollars is is nothing. Okay, it should have gone up. Ten dollars, twenty dollars on the kind of buying uh, that we saw. Um, so you know the answer becomes not so much why is everybody buying silver or did they decide to buy silver? And yeah, maybe it was you know the Reddit business and Robinhood, and I, 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 I don't you know diminish that in the least. Okay, but the real question is not why did so many. Uh, people buy it, but the real questions are why, when all these people uh, did come in to buy it, we had record volume, et cetera, record deposits, and what have you over the last couple of days. The real question is why it didn't go up more. I mean, that that to me is, is, is obvious, but even more obvious, even more obvious is, a, is the question, where the hell did this silver come from that they deposited? Okay, who in their right mind would give up a hundred million ounces, roughly, of silver over the last week, donated basically to the market that was buying it. Why did they? Why did they get rid of it at such a low price? Why? Why not demand more? I mean, they could have got five dollars more an ounce. They could have got ten dollars more an ounce. Then he, they could have gotten so much more in in selling their silver. Yet they seem to be content satisfied with selling it as low as they did. Why is that? I mean, that's, that, that's a question. And where did this silver come from? And I got to tell you, it's coming from the four and eight largest traders that are on the COMEX. They're behind, they're behind everything. And, you know, the silver had to come from this is absolutely a certainty as far as I'm concerned. It had to come from J.P. Morgan in some fashion. I don't know. I know it came from J.P. Morgan because J.P. Morgan has been buying silver, as far as I can see, for the last 10 years up until recently and have amassed, you know, just a massive stockpile of physical silver. So, so I know it's coming from them, this 100 million ounces that has basically been flowing into the, the silver ETS. What I don't know is that J.P. Morgan selling this silver a straight sale and, you know, giving up the silver and taking in money at a profit. I mean, their average price was, was, was about $18, best I can tell, over the years, cost of acu- average cost of, of, of acquisition. So they're getting, you know, $10 or so profit, which is decent. But no, J.P. Morgan knows they could get a lot more than that. So why are they letting go of it so cheaply now? The, the lead... The leading explanation, the most plausible explanation I have is that while they're getting rid of the silver, J.P. Morgan, they're not actually selling it. I think they're leasing it to other big shorts, other associated authorized participants that are in, in turn promising to pay the silver back. And that silver has found its way into this, into these silver ETFs, the SLVs and the others. So in that case, uh, it's, it's like that's an explanation for where the, the physical silver is coming from, because it's, it's not that plentiful. It's not, it's closely held. And then that's the question everybody should be asking themselves. Who, who's the heck is the part who's letting go of silver? People are lined up to buy it. Why are these big authorized participants in the SLV and the other silver ETFs, why are they letting it go so cheaply? And, and the only answer I can come up with is it's in part and parcel with the conversation that we've had to this point, which is to keep a lid on prices at all costs, to keep, to keep this thing from, from showing any signs of life and awakening those sleeping giants, those, those silver users that are out there that may or may not be aware of what's going on, and to keep them from panicking and buying physical silver to stockpile for when the inevitable shortage hits. And, you know, it's, it's a fascinating time that's going on. How much longer these big shorts on the COMEX 
can keep a lid on prices is anybody's guess. I mean, I, I don't know, but it, they're show, it's showing signs that uh, it's fraying at the uh, at the edges. And if the users that I speak of, the industrial users in silver, do what the retail buyers just did over the last several days, then you can pick any any price you want to the upside on silver that may seem crazy and extreme, but it, it won't be crazy or extreme enough. Mm -hmm. So, Ted, how, do, how does their, like JP Morgan, in a recent article you wrote, you were saying that they haven't held any significant gold or silver short positions for the last 10 months. Why is this and how does that play into what we're talking about here? Well, you know, J.P. Morgan stopped calling me and informing me of their opinion a while back. I mean, of course, I'm kidding. I, they, they've never called me, okay? They don't even respond to me calling them crooks. Of, uh, I can't tell you how many times over the last uh, uh, 10, 12 years or so. But, look, I mean, we, I, I can't read J.P. Morgan's mind no more than I can read your mind or anybody else's mind. Uh, all you can do is, is, is basically judge them you know, by their actions. And their actions are based on the same, you know, commitment of trader data that I've studied for, for 30, 35 years. It appears clear to me that over the last uh, 10, uh, 10 months or so, for the first time, or basically the first time in history, J.P. Morgan had uh, bought back all of its short positions at lower prices than, than what it had originally sold short at, and has been maintaining a flat position. Now, of course, you know, that could change. I mean, this next commitment of traders report uh, could show, which due on Friday could show or give indications that J.P. Morgan has returned to the short side. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll have to wait the data to, to kind of, you know, sense that or see that. But it's uh, a fact that they basically did, to me, eliminate their, their short position. The only thing I can think of is, is someone – covers their short position when they expect prices to go higher. If they expected prices to go lower, they they probably would have increased their short position. So it, it looks to me, and it's been you know personal premise of mine for, for some time running now, the, that J.P. Morgan has basically double-crossed its former big commercial uh, short sellers on the COMEX and, uh, you know, basically broke out. I think they've had a tremendous accumulation of physical gold and silver. I've said that for, for years now. And now that they've eliminated their short position, um, you know, I mean, the, the obvious conclusion is, you know, these would be the actions of someone who expects you know, sharply higher prices, and it and it's and it's also in in keeping with this business that I think they I believe they have leased out the the silver, the physical silver that's been flowing into these uh, silver ETFs uh, instead of uh, instead of just selling it. But uh, look, I can make the accusations, I can make the allegations, I can say all day long that when it comes to silver and gold, you know, J P Morgan is is a crook. Okay, but so are these other uh, commercial crooks. These uh, these other banks, you know, HSBC, Citibank, whatever. They're involved in something highly illegal, and it's kind of remarkable that uh, none of them complain. I mean, I, I grew up under the impression or uh, distinction that uh, you know you can't accuse a financial organization of, of doing something wrong. Uh, and, and not have any blowback or anything. But I, look, I haven't, I'm not a hard guy to find. If they object to what I'm saying, let them address it. Um, same thing with the uh, the COMEX, the CME group, and same thing with the Department of Justice, for that matter. So, I mean, I've, I've been petitioning these people for, for decades that there's something wrong here. And uh, yeah, I don't know, they don't, they don't seem to uh, want to respond, it, it would seem to me. Doesn't the, the leasing of the metals also create more downward pressure on price or, or basically also another version of short selling? 
Absolutely. I mean, the leasing of precious metals. I, I don't want to start on a whole new topic here, okay, because <laughs> it's something that I, when I first became introduced to the Internet or I became aware of the inter- in- Internet back in the mid-90s, 96 or something like that. I mean, leasing was what I talked about. It's so stupid. You can't lease a, a precious metal. I mean, it's, a, it, 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 it's not a, a utilitarian or productive asset like a renting a car or a truck or a, an apartment or something like that. The only thing you can do if you lease uh, a bar of metal is to, is to sell it or consume it which destroys the collateral. So the whole concept of leasing is just the stupidest damn thing that ever came down the pike. It's fraudulent. It's everything you want to say. And yet it is, in essence, when you when somebody gets involved in leasing something, they're basically it's just another version of short selling. And it's just bottom line is uh, the, these big shorts are in essence by leasing or adding short positions they're just doubling down they just keep selling oh short a commodity that is the cheapest commodity around silver and the only reason the plausible reason anybody would do such a stupid thing is short a commodity in a price hole, okay, so cheap, and then keep shorting it in various forms, there has to be an explanation. There has to be a, a reason for it, and there is a reason. But the reason is not legitimate. It's not a good reason in the sense that it's not a legitimate reason. It's, it's an illegitimate reason. They're doing it to keep the price suppressed because if this price it takes off like it should, and it will someday, to the upside. No one can possibly lose more than these big shorts. And that is just a tremendous incentive, along with the, with the new liability that they'll face when everybody realizes what they've been up to for the past few decades. Um, that's a powerful motivation, okay, to keep this sucker down. We can't let this thing see the light of day. I mean, this is this is like uh, their backs are to the wall. This is like serious, serious stuff. This is uh, as serious a, a, as it gets. So, I mean, that again, that's the way it looks to me. And uh, you know, I'm looking always looking for alternative explanations. What else could explain the continuous events that that are taking place other than the version that the narrative that that, that I've come up with? It's almost, uh, I'm saying this almost like a plea for an alternative explanation as to what could explain what's This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.